Welcome to News Breakdown. In today's episode, we'll be taking a look at the world's oldest tribe. The Khoisan are the oldest known tribe in the world. They have their unique way of life and how they live that is different to most people around the world. They have maintained this way of life for thousands of years and we'll be taking a look at this in this video. In this episode, we'll be taking a look at what part of the world they live in, the reason they're the oldest tribe, their language, how they live, the food they eat, and their customs. The world's oldest people can be found in Africa, and they are known as the Khoi Sun. This is a group of people that are made up of the Khoi Khoi and the Sun people. The Khoi Khoi people are now numbering about 55,000, mainly in Namibia and in the west of South Africa. The Khoi Khoi are related to the Sun and together they make up the Khoi Sun people. They speak a variation of the same language which is popularly known for its clicking sounds which are produced when this language is spoken. In around 2300 BP, which is before present, the Sun who were hunter coverers acquired domestic stock in what is now known as modern day Botswana. Their population grew and spread throughout the western half of South Africa. The Sun people are popularly thought of as foragers in the Kalahari Desert and the regions of Botswana, Namibia, Angola, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Lesotho and northern South Africa. The name Sun was derived from the Khoi Khoi, who referred to the hunter coverers as the Sun in their language. This simply means the ones without. The Khoi Khoi were known as the first pastoralists in Southern Africa and called themselves the Khoi Khoi, which means men of men or the real people. This name was chosen to show pride in their past and culture. The Khoi Khoi brought a new way of life to South Africa and to the Sun, who were hunter coverers as opposed to herders. The name Khoi Sun has its origins and was a way of describing the two groups of tribes, the Khoi Khoi and the Sun. The Khoi Khoi used a word whilst dancing that sounded like Hottentots and therefore the European settlers referred to them as Hottentots. However, today this term is considered derogatory. The Dutch settlers used the term Bushmen for the San. Many of those whom the colonists called the Bushmen were in fact Khoi Khoi or former Khoi Khoi. For this reason, scholars sometimes find it convenient to refer to the hunters and the herders together as the Khoi Sun. There are also some other tribes that live in the territory that was occupied by the Khoi Sun that we'll mention briefly. The Bantu people are one of the other larger tribes that are within the neighbouring territories of the countries of Kenya, Zimbabwe, Tanzania, South Africa, Mozambique and more countries that reach Central Africa. Khoisan peoples are the direct descendants of a very early dispersal of anatomically modern humans to Southern Africa before 150,000 years ago. Genetic studies suggest that both the Khoi Khoi and the Sun became isolated from other humans around this time. New genetic research on the Khoisan revealed they were once the largest group of humans some 22,000 years ago. They were the largest group of humans on Earth, the Khoisan a tribe of hunter-gatherers in Southern Africa. Today, only about 100,000 Khoisan remain. Their first people status is due to the fact that they commonly retain genetic elements of the most ancient Homo sapiens that have been found by archaeologists. This conclusion is based on evidence from specific types of DNA that have been uncovered. This evidence also demonstrates that other sub-Saharan human populations retain genetic bits and pieces of DNA from non Khoisan primordial humans. These predate their out-of-Africa colonization of the balance of the world. Their language is something that the Khoisan are famously known for around the world. Their language is described as the click language, in which clicks are like consonants. Linguists believe the more clicks you have, the older the language is. And this one has five, the most of any of the modern languages that are currently being used around the world. The Khoi languages are the largest group of languages that are indigenous to Southern Africa and are not a Bantu language. The most numerous and the only well-known Khoi language is Khoi Khoi, which is predominantly spoken by the Nama or the Damara of Namibia. The rest of the family is predominantly found in the Kalahari Desert of Botswana. The languages are similar enough that a fair degree of communication is possible between the Khoi Khoi and the languages of Botswana. The Khoi languages were the first Khoisan languages known to European colonists. 
the use of the click consonants is a typological feature that most sharply distinguishes Khoisan languages from other African languages. A few other African languages, such as Zulu or Dahalo, also make use of clicks, but it's clear that these languages belong to other language families. Like many other languages in Africa, the Khoisan languages make use of semantically toned melodies. Historically, the Khoisan were pastoral people inhabiting the coast of the Cape of Good Hope in historic times. The Khoi Khoi were the first African native people to come into contact with the Dutch settlers in the mid 17th century. As the Dutch settlers took over their land farms, the Khoisan were dispossessed from their historical inhabited land, exterminated or enslaved, and their numbers dwindled after the first contact with the Dutch settlers. They were similarly dispossessed and exterminated by the Germans in the early 1900s in Namibia. However, that's another story for another day. The Khoisan, in particular the Khoi Khoi, lived in villages. Each village recognised the authority of a herdman, a hereditary position passed on to the oldest son of the founding ancestor and so forth for every generation. Herdmen provided leadership regarding decision making within the village, for example, determining when and where to move, as well as acting as a mediator or judge in criminal civil disputes. Although villages enjoyed a fair degree of autonomy, several villages were united. Something I'd like to point out in this particular section of this episode is the fact that we are seeing the end of their culture and their hunter-gatherer lifestyle, which is being replaced by herding and agriculture. In Botswana, there is currently a law that the hunter-gatherers cannot hunt anymore. They are land disputes and in many cases, they're being pushed off their land they used to hunt or consider sacred. Nowadays, the Khoisan are settled in permanent villages, living as farmers and labourers. Within their societies, women have a high status in both the Sun and the Khoi Khoi society. They are greatly respected and may be leaders of their own family groups. They make important family and group decisions and claim ownership of waterholes and foraging areas. Women were mainly involved in the gathering of food, but may also take part in the hunting trips when they are required on occasions such as weddings and funerals. Their main role was to milk the animals and gathered wild plants from their environment, and the men killed game meat for everyday food and this is in relation to the sun. Clans used to marry outside of their own clan and men from one clan thus had to seek wives in another. Given the geographical proximity of related clans, it was possible for many men to find wives within the tribe. However, marriage between members of different tribes was also common. Marriage served as a powerful social mechanism to unite members of the tribe or to link different tribes together. This bond was reinforced by the custom that the bridegroom had to spend the first few months of marriage, often until the birth of the couple's first child, living at the village of the parents-in-law. This practice has sometimes been referred to as bride service. Thereafter, the residence was patriarchal. Marriage usually involved the transfer of kettle from the groom's family to the bride's parents. Polygamy was permitted, but not very common amongst the Khoisan. Parents were responsible for training their children in the basic substance skills following the basic sexual division of labor. Very close relationships existed between grandparents and their daughters' children and between children and their mother's brothers. Relationships between brothers and sisters and between father's sister and her brother's children were respectful and formal. In this section of the episode, we'll take a look at the diet of the two groups, known as the Khoi Sun. As explained earlier in the episode, the Khoi Khoi were known to have kept livestock and the Sun were hunter-gatherers. It is important to point out that each group had different ways and means of living off the land. The Khoi Khoi always lived on a high-protein diet that was courtesy of the livestock they kept. They used to herd their livestock around open areas of land in Southern Africa, according to seasons, and the changing availability of water and pasture. They roasted the meat and they also dried the meat for later use. Though times have changed from the origins of the two groups of people, their diets have not evolved in that time. You can of course expect that some modern processed foods have been introduced to their diet. However, overall, their diet has not changed. The influence of their diet is reflected in the common 
South African love for barbecue and biltong, which is dried preserved meat. Both groups were also known to forage the lands they occupied, eating mostly fruits that was found in their lands. They also were known to use different natural herbs and plants as a form of medication. They had comprehensive knowledge about the medicinal values of plants and they used natural items to cure hundreds of ailments. When the Khoisan used to go out hunting, they would use a very small bow and a very short arrow, which they make, and on the tip of the arrow, they place a poison that they produce from caterpillars. They are also amazing at trapping animals. They make the traps not with metal or rope, but only with natural materials like branches and grass and leaves. The animals that the Khoisan hunted included animals that were found within their territories that they occupied, such as eland, kudu, impala, and it is believed that they even hunted animals as large as elephants by digging a hole in the ground with a sharp stick in the middle so that the elephant will fall into the hole and the elephant will be impaled as shown by the image on the screen. The Khoisan are known for their incredible ability to tune into their surroundings to track animals across the land and take down wild game with the small poison tipped arrow as mentioned. All this knowledge will be lost if the younger generation does not get the chance to live this lifestyle. It may be already too late. The Khoisan are also known for drinking honey mead or honey wine. It is believed by some to be one of the world's oldest alcoholic drinks dating back 15,000 years. The Khoisan people are still producing this alcoholic drink using the ancient method as a mix of water and honey fermented with naturally occurring yeasts. In regards to what the Khoisan were, this has obviously changed over the years due to the introduction of modern materials to their wardrobes. What we'll be taking a look at in this episode is how they dressed prior to the introduction to modern materials and pre-colonization. Generally, the Khoisan men wore a braided necklace, while women wore a bundle fabric over their genital areas, comparable to modern underwear. The women wore skirts made of the same fabric and covered their breasts with a steep of cloth. Although these people are traditional Aboriginal people of the African desert, some of them are starting to wear Western star clothes. In this section of the episode, we'll be looking at some of the Khoisan customs and religious practices. Though not much is known about their religious practices, it is believed that the Khoisan were accorded religion, usually connected to the worship of the sun or the moon. The Khoi also believed in ghosts and witches, but not in the power of ancestors. However, there is some evidence that the spirits of the dead were involved in curing rituals. Some individuals within the Khoisan societies played a dominant role in healing or rainmaking rituals, but it would be wrong to view them as specialist religious practitioners with a modern day view of this. Another custom we will take a look at in this section will be in relation to how the Khoisan regarded the land they lived on. Individual clans or tribes controlled access to the land and resources on it, but there was a clear understanding that land could not be property of individuals. By contrast, all stock was individually owned and the wealthy stock owner was accorded high status. Wealthier stock owners almost invariably acquired their stock through inheritance. Customary inheritance patterns varied. In some tribes, the inheritance was shared among all the children. In others, only sons inherited. In yet others, the eldest son was the only heir. Another custom the Khoisan are famous for around the world is their rock paintings that still exist till this day and can be found across southern Africa. It is believed some of these paintings could be as old as 28,000 years old. The paintings most commonly depict animal scenes and it is thought that particular animals have important symbolic religious meanings. The paintings are believed to have been made by the Khoisan as part of their religion and thus not to be interpreted literally. Humans are also commonly depicted, often in procession, hunting or out covering food. Other types of paintings show half animal, half human figures and entopic shapes, probably of important religious meaning to the Khoisan. A notable mention would be how they dealt with social control, which is social disputes. Criminal and civil disputes were handled by the chief and his council, or in some cases by the village herdmen. Another custom that I'd like to mention as well is that the Khoisan and the Khoikhoi in particular had a practice of elongating their female labias. 
this would occur naturally or the labia would be stretched artificially. The labia would hang up to four inches outside of the vulva when they were standing in an upright position. The practice of labia stretching was usually performed by an older aunt on girls beginning the age of five. In conclusion, I would say many consider the Khoisan to have some of the most incredible knowledge and insights into wild animals and the environment that they inhabit. It is a shame we find ourselves in a time when their way of life is being threatened as all corners of the world continue to evolve and modernise. Their ability to extract nutrients from seemingly inconspicuous plants and survive in generally arid or inhospitable environments is incredible to me. Thanks for watching and please hit the subscribe button.